Welcome wrestling fans, welcome to Curtain Jerkin, as always I'm your host Jacob Grindy reporting for the Main Event Marks YouTube channel, you can also check me out on Spotify, and guys, guys, I gotta tell you, the numbers are going down, not trying to get too inside baseball here, but the numbers are going down, so if you guys know someone who likes wrestling, if you guys know someone who likes, you know, novice MMA commentary, nerdy things about wrestling's present day and past check me out uh and if you've listened to me a few years ago i think i've gotten better i think that i'm a better podcaster now than i was like a few years ago so maybe uh if you uh you hear my voice and you think you know oh i listened to that guy he was dog shit podcasting years ago check me out again i don't know play me on mute do your thing but maybe make my thing your thing too. Come on, it's just like 20 or 30 minutes a week. Let someone know about it. But let's just jump right in to the body of the show, the framework of the show, what you guys hopefully are here to listen to. It's We're going to be talking about AEW. We're going to be talking about The Rock. We're going to be talking about celebrity boxing. And we're also going to be talking about WWE releases. We knew it would happen when WWE and UFC merged together under one roof, under the Endeavor roof, to form TKO, they laid off and let go a hundred people from the backstage, from behind the scenes last week, and here some wrestlers got cut. This is the ones that I know about. Maybe the, a few slipped through the cracks. Maybe there's a few that got fired, but they didn't really want to uh, let anybody know. So uh, I don't know. Uh, so let's play a game here. Not only am I going to be announcing these releases, I'm going to be telling you where I want them to go, where I think they should go, where I would be most entertained by seeing in seeing them uh, move on. So we're going to start from the top, the most noteworthy, and we're going to work our way down. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me know in the comments below. Let me know uh, on Twitter. Tweet at me at JG Pro Wrestling if you disagree or you agree or what have you with these. Uh, these uh, predictions maybe are where these desires of where I want to see these people go. Dolph Ziggler. I know his brother's in AEW. And I know people want to see maybe them team up or something like that. But he has had a 20-year career in WWE. I don't want to see him um, go anywhere else. I don't know. It would be weird to see him go anywhere else. Who can forget that cash in on Raw where he won the WWE Championship. That was amazing. But a 20 year career is something to hang your hat on. Being a comedian is a new thing for him. I can see him doing that. He is already a stand up comedian. I guess I can see him being a more successful stand up comedian. He can do the podcast tour. Comedy is on the upside now, too. Like, uh, there's more comedians than ever selling out theaters, selling out arenas. He can be an opener on a big bill, which there's these big, like, comedy festivals going around now. So he's got a little bit of a name, a little bit of cachet to where he can, you know, be the first guy on a bill of three and, uh, you know, get his reps in in the comedy world. I think that would be kind of cool to see. See him kind of go a different route. You know, uh, we, we've seen Mick Foley do it. Uh, I think Roddy Piper does it. And we can also see, you know, Dolph Ziggler do it. But, you know, he's also like, I mean, what's held him back in the wrestling world is, you know, he's a little smaller. But in the comedy world, I mean, he's probably yoked. He's strong. He's going to stand up there uh, looking good. Um and I think that's kind of a trend in comedy. I mean, there's this guy, Matt Reif, who's kind of got that look. Dolph Ziggler, Matt Reif, I think they could pack the building. Shelton Benjamin is another one that got let go. Uh, I would love to see him go to New Japan. Uh, he had a great run in NOAA, and usually if you have a good run in NOAA, you just go over to New Japan. You have a good run there. Uh, look at Kinta, look at Ishimori. That seems to be the way you go about it. And plus, like... Uh, I mean, if he wants to have that style of match, that's where you'd have that style of match. Um, AEW, there's too many people there. Elias, though, he's gone as well. You know, for a show full of good wrestlers, the guys like Orange Cassidy and the Acclaim, the characters seem to be the ones that people gravitate to, and Elias is a character. So I wouldn't mind seeing Elias in AEW 
kind of doing the Max, Max Caster thing, but with, you know, country songs. Coming out there, uh, he can do some inside baseball, uh, you know, jokes and things to his songs that this more dedicated fan base at AW have will know about and enjoy. Uh, I think that he could work in AEW. You know, just having a segment a week out there in the crowd, popping the crowd. Uh, Mustafa Ali. I mean, I think he should go to New Japan. He could have a lot of good matches in AEW. Everyone wants to see him go to AEW. But look at Will Ospreay, comparatively speaking, to like Andrade. Or look at Will Ospreay, comparatively speaking, to uh, Malachi Black. The best way to have a standout AEW run seems to be go to New Japan and they'll book you uh, steady and well and then you will become a bigger star when you come over to AEW. I mean, look at Aussie Open. They were killing it in New Japan at the beginning half of the year. They officially signed with AEW and you know they're having one to two minute matches on collision for you don't see them for several weeks um, Fletcher is randomly losing to Orange Cassidy like they're all over the place so I think to have a good AEW run you start in New Japan and you become a big deal and then they bring you over like Will Ospreay and uh, we've seen it with you know the pretty much the New Japan roster once a year Emma got released for the second time with her husband, Mad Cat Moss. It would be cool to see both of them in Impact. I mean, I put up a poll. What was Emma's best era um, on Twitter or on X? Uh, WWE Run 1, WWE Run, Run 2, NXT, or Impact? Impact one-handedly. And Mad Cat has got some size to him. I can see him having a good match with Jake something. I can see him uh, you know, having a good match with Moose. Um, so I think that they would be good over there. Just go back to Impact, have a nice little life. Uh, don't they film in Nashville? You know, move to Nashville. You guys could kill it up there. Aaliyah, she got released. You got to feel for her. She spent seven years in NXT and only spent one year on the main roster. But she's gone. Top dollar. I don't think he uh, should give up entirely on wrestling. But definitely focus on like social media and uh, rapping. Like I know Enzo completely gave up on wrestling as he rapped and now had to go back to wrestling. So innately, anytime he goes to wrestling, it looks like a failure because he shit on it trying to get this failed rap career going. But I think you just don't publicly shit on either thing and kind of do both and just go where the money is. And I think Top Dollar could kill it at these Comic-Cons, could kill it at the Comic-Con after parties. Like Wale Mania has got Top Dollar all over it. And then he could also, you know, do some indies, do these big indie events. Uh, that's where I can see him going. Be just more of a character on social media that does wrestling, that does rapping, and get going from there. I don't really think uh, a week-to-week television is is uh where he should land rick boobs i see star in him too i don't think the week to week wrestling television should be where he goes at all i think that he's his star power goes beyond his wrestling abilities to the point where i want to see him in hollywood uh we've seen him in the old spice ads i think he could do more of that i think he could be you know um a character like in movies and things he's got this personality he's got something that we gravitate to him and it ain't just the solos and the biceps he's got this it factor um as far as a personality and i think he could i think he'd go to hollywood and uh you know do something over there uh dabakato i don't know maybe an nwa or mlw could use this guy he's got some size to him um, I really don't know because we haven't seen too much of this guy. He's been on TV since uh, Raw Underground, and he was, you know, standing behind Apollo Cruz when Apollo Cruz was doing that whole thing. Um, but as far as Dabakato, we don't. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I would say. Uh, I would say yeah, maybe an NWA or MLW might be uh, the best for him. Bryson Montana gotta be honest had to look this guy up but that's not a bad thing a lot of these guys have this wwe stink on them so if you see like dabakato come out on aew you're gonna roll your eyes a little bit if you see Aaliyah come out on aew you're gonna roll your eyes a little bit madcap moss same same similar thing but bryson montana had the wwe run 
So he learned a lot from the PC, but doesn't have that WWE stink on him. At least, you know, I'm, you know, he did a level up and shit like that, but he's gone. So I could see him going to AEW and doing well because he's a fresh face who's got some size, who knows a lot about the business because he learned a lot at the Performance Center. Shanky. I can see him uh, getting big on TikTok with these dances. Maybe him and Sotnam Singh could do a tag team with Jeff Jarrett uh, managing them uh, in AEW. I don't, I mean, you know, I don't really think too much about Shanky. I don't know. I don't really think too much about Mace. He's a guy who's been on TV for like four years now. Um, he did, uh, uh, what was, I forget the name of the, they did like kind of a, like a group where they took over Raw during 2020, during the uh, Thunderdome era. That kind of fizzled out. And then he did the Maximum Male Models. Before that, wasn't he an announcer that got beaten up by uh, Brock Lesnar? So they've tried like three things with him. None of them panned out. Um, I can see him going to Impact. Someone that was shocking to me, Mansoor, shooing for Impact. Uh, Impact makes a lot of money on TV rights. Uh, this guy is big in a part of the world where they will give you money for entertaining them. Um, so I think he's a shoe in for Impact. Impact, you know, they, they make most of their money with international television rights. This is a guy who will help with that. And I didn't realize how he's been getting yoked. He's strong as fuck. So um, I, th I, I think he's a shoe in for Impact. Quincy Miller. Uh, I can see him doing uh, Effie's Big Gay Brunch, Dana Brooke, her OnlyFans is going to be lit. Uh, let me know about more releases, I'll talk about them next episode. Um, but, you know, it wasn't all just doom and gloom. They had to release people to get someone to return, and on SmackDown, he fucking returned. The Rock, Pat McAfee returns as well out there, talking to Austin Theory, who is a great talker as well. Uh, pretty good in the ring. Pat Max says, it's not your show. It's the people's show. The Rock's music hit. The Rock comes out. Uh, he was uh, on college game day, kind of hinting at doing something like this. The pop was huge. Austin Theory in the ring. You know, uh, if you're in the ring with The Rock, you're going to get shit on. And The Rock immediately tells him to shut his bitch ass up. The Rock interrupts him, says it doesn't matter. Austin says The Rock's got the whole arena. Or, uh, Austin cuts The Rock off with it doesn't matter. The Rock gets the whole arena to chant you're in. And then the other side says asshole at Austin Theory. It was huge. It was electrifying, if you will. Uh, Theory attacks The Rock. Rock hits him with a spine buster. And then the people's elbow. But then in the back, Cena finds The Rock. They shake, they hug, so sick. What uh, we see as fans on the body of the show is what we have been asking for for months. Uh, one of the biggest superstars comes back. Behind the scenes, they fire 100 people. Uh, what can you do? I guess some people gotta go so you can make money for moments like this um, that's uh, that's the case here uh, uh, I do think that it seems like um, this strike this Hollywood strike is uh, coming to an end so maybe this might be all we see of The Rock this might be all we see of John Cena, but it was cool to have him back for a little bit. I don't think so. I think this was just testing the waters. Um, they didn't want to like have him in there with the bloodline if you didn't know what to do with them. So you put him in there with Austin Theory. You get everyone to call him an asshole, and then you make the paper on Saturday morning. I think this was great. Um, kind of just going into some random stuff here. Tommy Fury versus KSI. They had their little face off. I love this story. The YouTube boxer killer versus the biggest YouTube boxer in the UK. They're battling in Manchester. Uh, not really worth reviewing the face off word for word. But I'm interested in this fight October 14th. This is the same card that's going to have Logan Paul versus Dylan Dennis. And they've been promoting this card. Uh very well i think these four men have done a great job uh i'm surprised a lot of wrestling fans don't like this kind of shit it's very sports entertainment you don't know if it's real you don't know if it's fake you don't know where the shades of gray turn into just black and white blatant bullshit 
And I don't think anyone knows. I don't think even the people involved know where it begins and ends, um, which is kind of reminds me of how it was, or maybe not reminds me, but maybe takes me back to a day where maybe society was more naive toward pro wrestling prior to MMA, where we thought maybe people actually fought like they do in pro wrestling and things like that. Um, so I love this sports entertainment feel, this uh, celebrity boxing thing. And on October 14th, I'm pretty excited about it. I wasn't able to watch Will Ospreay versus uh, Mira Fuji. I'm going to get to it. Uh, uh, that's just a match I'm really looking forward to. I went to D.C. Uh, over the weekend, had a blast. But um, it's hard to catch up on a lot of pro wrestling. But I am definitely going to watch that match. I did watch AEW Collision and AEW Dynamite. I'm going to give you my separate Collision thoughts because comparing Collision nowadays to a show like Grand Slam isn't really fair to Collision. And uh, I'm going to just go right into it. Uh, this was, you know, a good show but felt skippable, which is not good. On Saturday nights, these people are staying home, and mainly if you're staying home, you're going to watch college football. You also have to compete with UFCs. You have to compete with WWE pay-per-views. So this show cannot be skippable to survive. Uh, the promos were good off the top, of course. The matches were good, but there needs to be something we can sink our teeth into. There's a few little things here, but you got to have like, you know, like two or three things. Like the show's just got to be money, money, money. Money. More so than Dynamite. I feel like Dynamite solidified it's a Wednesday night thing, um, and it's been on for four years now. Where, where Collision lost its biggest star, has only been around for a few months now. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can see the ratings dropping here. Um, the the production uh, kept fucking up during like Keith Lee's promo. You saw that little uh, clip thing that said "Take 22." It took them 22 takes to. Uh, introduce Shane, uh, Lee Moriarty to Shane Taylor Promotions via interrupting Keith Lee. I'm interested to see where this goes. Um, Keith Lee has been like floundering, I think ever since he kind of came into WW, or into AEW. You know, this is a guy who wrestled Roman Reigns, wrestled Randy Orton, was in the thick of the top of the top in 2021, had some health issues, got released from WWE, Signed to AEW was a big deal for like literally like two weeks. Kind of stumbled into a tag run with with Swerve. Kind of stumbled out of that, and now here he is again. He ain't getting no younger. Uh, we got to figure out what to do with him, or just let his contract run out. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on with Keith Lee. The sit down with Tony Storm in RJ City was great. She has always been a good wrestler, but now she's really found herself as a character. But this is like this great character, this disheveled Hollywood Scarlet is pretty awesome. I think people that don't like pro wrestling will like this character. I think she has kind of tapped into like a uh, co an odd charisma and point of view um, that. A lot of people can kind of relate to and find it funny. She's funny doing this. Um, they recap the Golden Lovers storyline, uh, which is good get, get people to catch up here. Uh, the guy who makes this show, to me, is Ricky Starks, in my opinion. The angle with him and Danielson is great. It's uh, kind of what I'm talking about when I say I need to sink my teeth into something. I think this is a great program. They're bringing guys like Big Bill in. They're bringing Claudio in. And they're having a Texas death match. Starks from Texas. Danielson has one on him in a singles capacity with the strap match, which is great. Starks is going uh, to hopefully get this win here because, uh, you know, Danielson got the win last time. AW needs a good heel, and I think Starks can be that heel because MJF is full on face now. And AEW needs something like this. Uh, going into the matches, Starks and Big Bill. Uh, get get a victory on Danielson here um, in a tag match. This match was the best match on the show. Anytime Claudio picks up Big Bill, it's a five-star classic to me. Uh, like JR, I love feats of strength. FDR makes short work of Iron Savages. Ozzy Open makes short work of PB Smooth and Wes Berkeley. Stoked for them to have a... Uh, you know, this match here, Wrestle Dream, run it back. Uh, these are the, you know, in my opinion, the two best tag teams of 2023. 
they've already wrestled each other I think once or twice in 2022 or maybe early 2023 but they're having another one here uh, I love these guys uh, being as they are you know or excuse me excuse, I got ahead of myself here because I'm really excited about the work horseman getting an F uh, uh, ROH t uh, AEW title shot with um, FTR they come out and the crowd chants who are you and I gotta say you know Anthony Henry was in NXT it was in NXT for a year and has been in AEW for a little over a year JD Drake has been on AEW TV since like 2020 so I think this crowd has exposed themselves as casual fans which is a no-no in AEW you can't be a casual fan you gotta know all the Japanese people you gotta know all the Mexican people coming out and who they are why they're there you gotta know all this shit what a crazy chant for someone who for for a team that's been in AEW TV for a while now Scorpio Sky versus Andrade uh, they had a good match. Andrade wins with the figure eight. John Silver beats Anthony Bowens because Evil Uno comes from under the ring. I might be tired of Dark Order. I might be tired of them. They have uh, they might have ran their course. I don't think I get excited even when someone like Johnny Hungy comes out. Hardy's in the main event with the Righteous. Uh, I think the Righteous do the cult scary thing better than the Dark Order. And on AWTV, even though they've been around a lot longer in Ring of Honor, they come across as less stale and less corny. And uh, they get the win over the Hardys here. So I don't feel like Tony Khan really trusts Jeff Hardy, but I also feel like we're getting good matches with the Righteous out of this. And we'll see where things go in the future with uh, the Righteous. A lot of ROH guys creeping their way on the collision, creeping their way on the dynamite. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Uh, but going over to AEW Grand Slam, you got to love Roderick Strong. He continues to be hilarious. He's in the hospital bed with the kingdom. Adam Cole comes up, has to leave to support MJF, and Roddy doesn't like that, of course. And then they go to MJF and Adam Cole pulling up in a Porsche. Uh, Christian Cage issues a challenge to Darby Allen for the TNT title. Luchasaurus versus Darby versus Christian for the TNT title. I think that there's going to be a little flub here where Luchasaurus is trying to get the win to Christian, but then Darby ends up rolling Christian up for the 1-2-3, and then, they, then Christian and Luchasaurus both lose the TNT title. Then you got the dinosaur mad at the Christian, and we got, uh, you know, we get to see Christian get his comeuppance there a little bit. I Maybe I'm just uh, booking with my heart and not my head here. Uh, tag Team Battle Royal on Rampage for the ROH Tag Titles. They literally just did this shit like less than a month ago. But let's jump to the matches. Uh, this podcast is pretty long, so I'm not going to go into the matches as in-depth as I usually go into. I'm just going to go into like the feeling of uh, these matches and um, you know, just my overall thoughts on, on them. Number five out of five, Phoenix versus Moxley. I mean, this was a good match, but then Phoenix hits his pile driver. One, two. Moxley does not kick out. Rick's not, Rick Knox does not count the pin. The crowd is like, what the fuck? And so he ruins the, sh the match. No one is giving a fuck about the great match anymore. They see, they're like, this shit is fake. You just exposed it. Uh, why didn't you count three? Phoenix is like, what the fuck? And this is all because Moxley is has a concussion. He's not silly. So it would make sense in the grand scheme of things and in wrestling sense to count three right there. And he just did not fucking do it. So Phoenix picks up John Moxley, someone who is already concussed, and hits the exact same move again that concussed him. We don't know, you know, where the injury had or I don't know where the injury happened, but I definitely know that if you drop someone on their head and they get injured, don't pick them up and drop them on their head again. Rick Knox fucked this whole thing up. Just count three. If the guy's, it's his job to kick out. It's your job to count three. I mean, it's cut and dry like that, buddy. We got a new international champion. It's cool to see Phoenix with some singles gold. Uh, number four, Sammy versus Jericho. This match told a good story, but was kind of clunky. The shooting star getting countered by the code breaker looked good on paper, but just like the rest of the match, it looked kind of clunky. Jericho gets the win. One, two, three. That sits at number four. Number three, Tony Storm versus Soraya. Tony has found herself, and she's also found her slippers under the ring. She exposes her bottom turnbuckle pad in an attempt to hit 
the um, running hip attack. It ends up biting her in the ass. Uh, ran into uh, Soraya after that and then gets the victory. Uh, Soraya retains. A lot of people didn't like that the fact that Soraya has this title, but this match here was pretty good. It was booked uh, heavily. A lot of uh, bells and whistles, but I don't mind something like this because, uh, I mean, okay, in a show full of people that are trying to steal the show, the best way to steal the show is to do something different. And everyone's trying to go out there and have a five-star uh, classic, which is awesome, but at the end of the day, I would have to say the guys on the AW roster are better than the women. So, if the women go out there and try to have a five-star classic like the dudes, they're always going to have one of like the like the bottom level matches on the show. Uh, where if they go out there, have elements of, you know, what makes a five-star classic a five-star classic with like cool moves and everything, but then combine it with like maybe a little Memphis here, a little ECW there, they can actually have better matches because they're going to stand out on the show. I know that might be a controversial statement, but this is coming from the heart. This is truly how I feel about the AEW women's division here, and I thought this match was great. Number two, MJF versus Joe. Joe main eventing a stadium show. This was sick. MJF with the video package kind of uh, ripping off uh, the old Bret Hart um, commercial, wearing the Mets, uh, like, inspired gear here. Uh, this was a great match in front of this New York crowd. Adam Cole possibly injures himself, jumping, jumping from the ramp to the floor. MGF does the lariat counter into a Liger Bomb thing that Osprey does, but this was to Joe, so feats of fucking strength all day here. MGF cheats the win and gets the victory. You gotta love it. Great main event, but the match of the show is Claudio versus Eddie for the ROH title. The curtain jerker. Eddie beats Claudio. Eddie beats Claudio. What a fucking match. The story of ROH in 2023 has got its happy ending. Uh, the story... The 20-year story here has got its happy ending in the ring. They probably just don't like each other, whatever. Eddie now has two titles. What a year he has. He's got the New Japan Strong title. He's got the ROH Championship. He went to the G1. Uh, what happens now? I mean, honestly, I would give up on this Keith Lee thing, and I would have Shane Taylor versus Eddie Kingston in just a brawling feud. you got Shane Taylor promotion guys that you can kind of bring in to the fold here to go up against Eddie in the uh, weeks leading up to the big match. You can have Shane Taylor versus Eddie Kingston. That's what I would do. Um, but until then, I just want you guys to continue to love pro wrestling as I do. I love talking about this with you guys. Um, fly high. I'm out.